Um, if you took a look at your bulletin, you can see what we're talking about this morning. The sermon is called Sacrifice and Receive. And we're going back to an idea that I um, spoke about in the beginning of June. And so way back in June 3rd, does anybody remember the beginning of June? Way back in June 3rd, on June 3rd, I, um, I recapped for us all, I reminded us all of our vision statement as a church. We are a church that has a vision statement. It's a simple statement that really speaks to who we are and why we're here and what we're doing. And that vision statement is engaging in the mission of God for the sake of the lost. That's who we are as a church. We are engaging in the mission of God. We believe that God is on a mission, and his mission is to rescue the lost, and we're a part of that. We're engaging in the mission of God, and it's not for our own sake as Christians. It's for the sake of the lost. Now, sometimes when I talk about our vision statement, you know, again, it's an opportunity to, for those of us who have been around for a while to remind ourselves of why we're here and what we're doing. It's also a great opportunity for new people to figure out what is this church about. But sometimes when I preach on this vision statement, I get a question from mature, saved Christian people. You know, it's one thing to enter into this space, and you're not sure if you're a Christian or not. You're kind of testing out all these ideas, and you hear this vision statement about, here's this church that exists for the sake of people who aren't already Christians, and that might resonate with you. You might think, okay, great. This church is for me. This church might actually have something for me. But then on the other hand, we have those of us who are Christians, and maybe even mature Christians, and sometimes mature Christians ask me the question, well, what does Hope Community Church have for me? You know, this church exists for the sake of the lost. I ain't lost, right? I'm saved. I'm a Christian. I've been around. I'm familiar with Scripture. And so what does this church have for me? And I want to tell you that I think that's a good question to ask, and I'm going to attempt to give you an answer. Okay, so all you saved people out there, all you Christian people out there, if you've ever wondered, well, what does a church that exists for the sake of the lost have for me? I will attempt to answer that question this morning. Years ago, we had a couple who made a connection with Hope Community Church, and it was, a, you know, for a brief season, they were with us, and they, they were leaving an old church, and they connected with us, and this couple, they had, um, they had some adult children, so that's the stage of life they were in. They were almost grandparents, that stage of life, and uh, this was a saved couple, okay, a Christian couple. They knew Jesus Christ as their Savior. Uh, they were saved. Got it? All right, great. So a saved couple, and they make a connection with Hope Community Church, and they have, like I said, some adult children, and they had an adult son who was not saved, not a Christian, and quite frankly, not interested in church stuff, not really interested in Jesus, not really interested in making a connection with a local church. But he was a very cool guy, polite guy, friendly guy, and he loved his parents, and he would, on occasion, come to worship with his parents, just, you know, just to make them happy. And he's not really buying into it, and he's not believing, but he's, again, friendly. He doesn't have a bad attitude, and he would show up and worship on occasion. And then he'd show up more regularly, and we'd see him on a fairly frequent basis. He would show up again. He's not a saved person. He is a lost person, as in does not yet know Jesus as his Savior. And so as, as time would go on, he he made some friendships with people in the congregation. And you know how friendship starts. I mean, just the, just the beginnings, just the beginnings of relationships would form. And this young man, over time, he experienced a, a season in his life that was very difficult. And during that season, those friends from the church supported him and, and helped him out and were there for him. And after a little while, this, this young man accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior. And he stood up, this is back in our days when we were at the Barnstormers Theater. Y'all remember the Barnstormers? Some of you were there back then? He stood up on that stage and was baptized. How about that? Let me just pause this story for a moment to tell you, like, that's why we're here. That's why we exist as a church, is for stories like that. And I wish we had more of those stories, and we have some, and I, I want to accumulate more as time goes on. But that's, that's why we're here as a church. And so let me ask you, plump. Plump, plop yourself into that story, okay? Let's say you're the parents of that young man. How would you feel? You know, you've got this son who was on a road that was really, I mean, he was destined for destruction. He was apart from Jesus Christ, and now he knows Jesus as his Savior, and now he's going to heaven. How would you feel? Pleasant, pleased. I mean, how would you feel? Appreciative, grateful? How would you feel if you were in that situation? Or let's make it a little broader. If you have a lost loved one in your life and they receive Jesus as their Savior, how would you feel? 
how would you respond to that? Well, I'll tell you how this specific couple responded. They left the church. <laughs> oh, right. They left the church. And you know why they left the church? And this is kind of a sad story. It's a beautiful day. I'm telling the sad story. Do you know why they left the church? It was because of me. It was me. They didn't like my preaching, right? I get it. I'm not for everybody. I mean, it's a tough thing to hear. I'm not everybody's cup of tea. But they say, you know, we just, we want a different style of preaching. We want better preaching. Because what I was doing, it just wasn't good enough for them. It just, well, everybody's so sad. I'm sorry to share that. It's such a bummer, right? It's a sad story. But it just wasn't good enough for them. And I tell you this story, and, and the sad truth is I have collected several stories very similar to this over the past 11 years of Christian people, mature, saved Christian people making a connection with hope and then for some reason or another, they decide that who we are and what we are is just not good enough for them anymore. In our culture, here in the United States of America, where I'm very, very glad to be born here. I love this country, and I'm so grateful to be a part of this country. I mean, I've spent a little bit of time overseas, and to see what the rest of the world is like and to be here, I'm so grateful to be here. But here in this country, we have this consumer mentality and it is so prevalent in our culture that we don't even see it in ourselves we are consumers in this country and we are demanding consumers we want what we want and we want it yesterday I mean that's our mentality here it wasn't always this way I mean I think back to the old days when I was a kid you know 80s night Rose Tree Park I think back to the 80s right when you wanted to buy something and you had to send away for it, does anybody remember those days and you fill out that little thing and you'd send away for it? And six to eight weeks, you had to wait. Six to eight weeks, are you kidding me? And then you'd finally get that thing that showed up that you ordered and you sent away in the mail. You had to write a, write a paper check and send away for it. It's crazy. Nowadays, I want it, I want it today. I want it, I want it now. And sometimes I think it's okay to have a consumer mentality. I think, I, I mean, I'm not sure. I mean, if you're actually a consumer and you go to a shopping mall, which I'm told still exists. Shopping malls are still a thing, right? If you go to a mall and you have an unpleasant experience, you buy something from a store and it doesn't meet your standards, you can just leave, right? You say, I'm going to take my business elsewhere. But we have this consumer mentality about shopping malls, about the gym, the health club, our kids' daycare, and it's just like, if I'm not getting what I want, then I'm taking my business elsewhere. And for so many of us Christians, this self-focused this self-centered consumer mentality has seeped right into our attitudes towards church, and we haven't even noticed it. There's no delineation between the attitude we have towards our local shopping mall and the attitudes we have towards our church experience. We want what we want, and we want it now. That's the consumer mindset. The consumer mentality takes place here in this country. There was a young woman, this is maybe in year two or three of Hope Community Church, young saved woman, a Christian woman, and she visited our church two or three times. And that last time that she visited our church, she heard our vision statement. We are engaging in the mission of God for the sake of the lost, not for the sake of the saved, for the sake of the lost. And she had a conversation with me after that service and said, why would I want to be a part of this church? And I greatly appreciated her candor. She said, I'm already saved. This church isn't for me. I'm going elsewhere. And I, I, again, that's kind of a sad story, but I appreciate that honesty and that candor for someone to say, well, this clearly isn't for me, so I'm leaving. So let me attempt to answer that question for those of you who are Christians, for those of you who are mature Christians, for those of you who are saved. What does a church that exists for the sake of the lost have for you? What do we have to offer you saved people? Nothing. Let's close in prayer. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? I'm very tempted. Like, let's just do it. Let's just close. Let's just close right there. If you're a saved person, you know Jesus as your Savior. 
You're mature. You're familiar with the Bible. You've been around. This church has nothing for you. If you're holding on to that consumer mentality towards church, towards Jesus, towards Christianity, if you're holding on to that, then we have nothing for you. Because our church will never, it will never be good enough for you. I have a friend, and this was six years ago, I have a friend who, uh, who left his church, and I'm not exactly sure why, I'm still cloudy on the details, but he was part of a church for decades, and he left that church, and uh, he is um, someone who went to a Bible college, and he had um, served, he led small groups, he led Bible studies, he led men's ministry, and so he had been active in his previous church, and so he was out there in the world looking for a new church, right? Church shopping, which is kind of an ugly term, it was church Church seeking, let's say that, that sounds better. So he's seeking for a new church, and uh, he was talking me through his process, and he'd narrowed that search down to two options. There was one church that was a church plant, right? A church startup. And it just so happened that this friend of mine, his friend was a pastor starting this brand new church. And so a brand new church has just about nothing, right? No programs, no people, no leadership. It was really ground level, right? They had a facility they were renting, they had a guy and a guitar to do music, and they had a preacher. They had the, the bare minimum. They had it, right? They had that situation, and so he was looking at that church, and then he had another option, which is like on the exact opposite end of the spectrum, the fully established product. You know, the church that's got it all figured out, the beautiful facility where the walls aren't crumbling, right? The child care programs, the ministries, the leadership, it was all, did that hit close to home? It was all there. They had everything fully established. The full country club experience of churches, yes? Had it all. And I was hoping that my friend would choose the church plant option because I'm a church planter. <laughs> and I know how tough it is to attract people to that and say, we need leaders. We need people who can lead men's ministry, who can lead Bible studies, who can lead small groups. And so he went through that process, and he ended up choosing this one, the fully established church. And he told me why. I said, Josh, you know, I just, I go into this place, and I know he's my friend, but the preaching just doesn't connect with me. But I go over here, and goodness gracious, I mean, the music on Sunday mornings, it's like K-Love Live, baby, right? It's a concert <laughs> every week. And this preacher you should hear, I'm like, I know, I've heard his preaching. This preacher is tremendous. And I walk in there and I leave that space just like, wow. I'm like, okay, I get it. It's tough to resist. And so that was six years ago. We moved forward in the timeline five years, okay, so just about one year ago. And I was having a conversation with this same friend. And he brought up what was going on in the life of his church. He told me, ah, Josh, I don't know. I mean... I just feel like I've heard it all before. I go on Sunday mornings, and the preaching, and this is a quote, the preaching, it's just not speaking to my soul. I'm thinking, now, there are times to speak and there are times to be silent, and I chose to be silent. But I'm thinking, man, what was so attractive, was so attractive five years ago is now unappealing. What, what, what's with that? How can that even be? How can, what, what once was, was just satisfying, what's once satiated your spirit, which once you were so excited about, now it's the same place, nothing has changed. Why, why do you now have a, a negative, critical uh, kind of attitude about what's going on in the life of your church? What's, what's with that? You guys familiar with Jim Gaffigan, comedian, who will be forever associated with? Oh, pockets. You know Jim Gaffigan? One person knows Jim Gaffigan, and it's my wife. Okay, two, three, great, three, that's enough. He's a comedian. You know what comedy is? Okay. He's a comedian, and he does this bit <laughs> about going to Disney World with his family. He's got, I don't know, 100 kids or something like that. He's going to Disney World with his family, and he stays in Magic Kingdom. No, he stays in Animal Kingdom. That's it. Stays in Animal Kingdom right on the property, a hotel on the property, and they open up their window, and there's a giraffe. And it's like, wow, this is magical, Disney, right? Look at this. And the next morning, they wake up, and they open the window. Oh, giraffe again. Hmm. How about a lion, Disney? How about a lion attacking a giraffe? That would be magical, Disney, right? But he just speaks to this thing. It's not my joke, it's Jim Gaffigan's. But he just speaks to this thing where it's like what once was awesome 
What once was fantastic, eh, starts to lose its appeal. You know what this is like. Remember when you got that new car? I mean, maybe it was used, but it was new to you. I was like, ooh, this thing is sweet, right? And then it's like getting older, and there are fancier, you know, features now available, and it just starts to lose its luster. Maybe you've, done, maybe you've been on a fancy vacation. Do you ever go on a fancy vacation? I've been on fancy vacations, all right? It's good to be friends with people who have money. Let me just throw that out there. I've been on fancy vacations, and you show up that first day, and you're like, wow, this is awesome. And the second day, it's like, yeah, we're having a good time. And the third day, it's like, why are there wet towels still on the bathroom floor? <laughs> What's going on here? This is human nature. What, what once was exciting and satisfying is just like, ugh, it's lost. It's lost its luster. Why is that? Why is that? Take a look at what Jesus says. I think this ties into this consumer mentality. I think it ties in there. Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple, I'm going to pause there. Jesus doesn't say whoever wants to be a Christian. He doesn't use that terminology. He says whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. If you want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, there's something in you, there's something you're going to have to deny. Sacrifice is an essential, non-negotiable component of being a disciple. Did my volume just turn up? What's with that? Is that how Christianity was presented to you? Let me think about that. Were you told that sacrifice is an inescapable part of what it means to be a disciple, not a Christian, but a disciple of Jesus Christ, if anyone wants to be my disciple, they must, not should, they must deny themselves and take up their cross. I'm going to pause again. Nowadays, the cross is symbolic. Hey, there's one right there. The cross symbolizes Christianity. The cross is a symbol for Jesus. The cross is also a symbol for burden. When Jesus speaks these words, the cross is not a symbol yet. It's a real thing. It's an instrument of death. It's an instrument of execution. And Jesus says, if you want to be my disciple, you need to deny yourself. You must. You must deny yourself and then pick up that instrument of death and then follow me. I mean, Jesus quite literally picked up his instrument of death and he went and he died. There's something that must be sacrificed in order to be a disciple of Jesus. For whoever, verse 25, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. And so Jesus is beginning to unpack this idea, explain this idea, and it just makes sense. If you're questing for something that's self-centered, yes, it's just never going to be enough if you're questing after something that's all about just meeting your own needs, your own desires, your own wants, you get that thing, and then it's never going to be enough. If you're just living for yourself, it's never enough. Some of you are old enough now to realize that. You go and pursue your own dreams, your own wants, your own desires, and you get what you wanted, and it's just like, well, this isn't enough. Let me go to that next tier, and this isn't enough, and let me just keep pursuing myself and what I want, and it's never, it's never, it's never enough. But whoever loses their life for my sake, Jesus says, will find it. Or is it, I'm not going to pursue self and self-interest. I'm not going to pursue and try to come up with what I want to do for my life. It's not about me anymore. No, I'm going to make my life about Jesus. Maybe those of you who are Christians, maybe you grew up in the same kind of environment that I did. I had this idea growing up in a Christian church that, that, okay, I'm a saved person, and so I've got Jesus with me in my life. I've got Jesus in my heart, and I'm saved. And so what I'm going to do, here I am growing up in church, 16, 17 years old. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make my plans for my life. I'm going to do what I want to do with my life, and Jesus is invited for the ride, right? That's the mentality that so many of us take towards Jesus. I'm not going to give up my life, my plans, what I want to do. No, 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 no. I'm going to do what I want to do with my life, and Jesus, 
you're invited with me. Jesus says, no. No, no, no. If you want to be my disciple, you give up all of that. And you take up your cross, and then you can follow me. There's something in you that's going to have to be sacrificed. There's going to be a death that needs to happen somewhere in your heart. But whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Or what can you give in exchange for your soul? And so here's what generations of Christians, generations of disciples have discovered. Is when we give up on what we thought we wanted for our lives, we end up receiving something much better. I mean, think about it. We have this track. We're all put on this track. We start in elementary school. We're on this track. Do well in school. Do well in college. Get a good job. Get paid a lot of money. Be as comfortable as possible. That's the goal, yes? That's the unspoken goal of life. Make yourself as comfortable as possible. Store up as much comforts as you can, yes? Retire as young as you can. Go on as many vacations as you can. And then die. What did I do with my life? I've just lost it. I had a brief period of time on planet Earth and I wasted it on myself? You see what Jesus is saying? Like, we're not the first generation to read these words and discover, like, this is, this is vanity. The whole book of Ecclesiastes, which some of us love, the whole book of Ecclesiastes, here's King Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived in Old Testament times, the wisest man who lived pursuing all these different avenues. What can I do in life that matters? What can I do in life that matters? I'm going to pursue this. I'm going to pursue that. I'm going to pursue that. And none of it matters. It's all futile. It's all meaningless. Except for one thing. Doing God's will. Keeping his commandments. He says, if you want to pursue self-interest, go ahead. You're going to waste your life. You're going to lose this opportunity. But if you give up your plans for your life, if you give up all of that, and if you seek after me, you're going to find real life. In John chapter 10, Jesus talks about this abundant life that he has to offer his disciples. This is a homeless man talking to all the homeless people saying, I've got an abundant life for you. A life that's filled with meaning and purpose, doing something with the limited time you have on this planet that matters. That's what Jesus has for us. So let me talk to you Christian people out there, all right? You saved, mature Christians. Let me talk to you. What are you doing with your lives? Are you like me when I was younger, just saying, oh, I'm going to do whatever I want and take Jesus along for the ride? What are you doing, Christians? Are you bouncing? You're bouncing from church to church, taking what you can and then moving on to the next place, taking, taking, taking. This is what I want. Okay, I got, I got it. Now I'm leaving. What are you doing, Christians? Serving your church, but only as little as possible to check off that serving box. Or maybe you're not serving at all. You're just taking. You're just consuming from your church, consuming from Jesus, and then you're on, you're on your way. There's this crazy stat about American Christians um, we leave between seven to nine churches before we land at our final church. And when I share that statistic with new Christians, they're like, what? Why would that happen? This is why. If we hold on to that consumer, self-focused attitude towards Christianity, towards Jesus, we might be temporarily satiated, but then eventually it's not going to be good enough. This can't be following Jesus. It can't be about us. It has to be about Jesus. So if you are saved, I'm not joking around, guys. If you're saved, and if you have this self-centered, consumer-driven attitude towards church, and if you're not willing to kill that off, then please know that Hope Community Church is not for you. We're not here for you. And I don't say that in a mean way. I say that for your own sake. If you've got that self-centered, consumer-driven mentality towards church, you are eventually going to be miserable here. If you don't kill that off, you're going to be miserable here, and that miserable is going to spill on to the rest of us. And so do yourself a favor. Reconsider. We're not the only church in town. Happy Sunday, everybody. We're having a good time. Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday. 
We're having fun. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I, I you know, preached on our vision statement. I do that about once a year, preach on the vision statement, engaging the mission of God for the sake of the lost. And not every time that I preach that, but on occasion, someone will approach me in the days after I preach that sermon. Hey, here we are. We're engaging the mission of God for the sake of the lost. Not for the sake of the saved, but the sake of the lost. And every once in a while, it's happened three times since we've been in this building. Every once in a while, someone will approach me in the days after I preach that message. And they'll say, Josh, so-and-so from our congregation, they're thinking about leaving this church. I mean, you stood up there on Sunday morning and you said this church is not for, for us saved people, it's for the lost. And now, because of you, pastor, because of you, people are thinking about leaving. And my response, I, you know, I don't quite know how to respond politely to that other than to say, well, yeah, that was the point of the sermon, right? That's the point. You know, last month I preached, I preached a three-part series on reading the Bible. If you came up to me and said, you know, pastor, people are thinking about reading their Bible now. I'd be like, oh, that's great. That was the point, right? But the point of today's message, and I don't want anybody to have hurt feelings, but the point of today's message, I just want to talk for a moment to the saved Christian, mature Christian people. And I'm encouraging you to reconsider your membership with Hope Community Church. That's the point of today's message. Reconsider. If you've got that self-centered and I just want what I want and I want it now, I'm telling you, eventually, you're not going to be happy here. Reconsider your affiliation and your membership with this church. And so save people. It's really true. Save people. We have nothing for you here. Unless. Unless you're seeking something more than just temporary, self-centered satisfaction. All right, saved people, we have nothing for you here unless, unless you actually want to be part of something that's bigger than yourself. If you're content just to be saved, then you could be saved somewhere else, okay? If you're willing to die to self, if you're willing to sacrifice, then we have something for you here. Here's what we have for the saved. Again, if you're willing to kill off that self-centeredness, if you're willing to kill off that consumer mentality, here's what we have for you. We have the opportunity for you to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's what we have for you saved people. We have the opportunity for you to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. But if you want to be a disciple, you have to pick up your cross, and you have to take your consumer mentality towards church, and you have to nail it to that cross, and you have to watch it die. And once you do that, you can be a disciple of Jesus Christ. The choice is yours. You can be a saved Christian consumer, or you can be a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's the choice. It can't be both. I'm going to say that again for the sake of our note takers. You can be a saved Christian consumer or you can be a disciple of Jesus Christ, but you cannot be both. A disciple of Jesus Christ is invested in their own spiritual growth. Yes, a disciple is invested in their own spiritual maturing, but it is not a self-centered desire for growth. It is a love-centered desire for growth. A love of Jesus that compels us to get to know him better. A love for Jesus that compels us to be better equipped to serve him. A love for Jesus that compels us to be more effective in fulfilling his mission right here and right now. And a disciple of Jesus Christ, and this is key, is actively engaged in the discipleship of others. Not just themselves, but of others as well. A disciple of Jesus Christ, and I've tried to explain this idea in the past, and I'll try to unpack it again for us today. A disciple of Jesus Christ actively engages in their own discipleship and actively engages in the discipleship of others. Let me try to explain what that looks like practically. How does a disciple of Jesus engage in their own discipleship? Well, you do the stuff that a disciple is supposed to do. You show up at this thing. A disciple of Jesus Christ, if they're actively engaging in their own spiritual growth, if they're actively engaging in their own spiritual maturity, they show up at the large group. And they listen. 
and they're led and they're directed. Do you know what happens during the large group time? Do you know what happens here during the large group time? I mean, I get 52 opportunities to do this a year, to stand up and help course correct. That's what I do. You know, that's what, that's what a sermon is. You realize that? I look at where are we as a church and where do we need to be and hear all the gap issues and God, where do we need to be corrected? Where do we need to be encouraged? Where do we need to be led? That's what happens on Sunday mornings. So a disciple makes this a priority. And I realize I'm talking about that during the summer and you're going to go on vacation. And that's great. Go on vacation guilt-free. That's the best reason to miss worship is being on vacation. You need that. But a disciple makes this large group time a priority. A disciple attends small groups. That's what a disciple of Jesus Christ does. I want you to think about this. Got a couple months to dwell on this. I mean, some of you have kind of tried to tiptoe into small groups. Some of you have said, no, it's just not for me. In the fall, we're offering more small groups. In the fall, we're offering you opportunities to connect. A disciple of Jesus Christ goes and connects with a small group. Why? Because you can't ask me questions now. I mean, you could try, but it would be very awkward. All right? This is me standing and talking to you, and you're sitting there very politely and you're listening. In a small group, you can ask questions. There's something that happens there that can't happen here. A disciple attends a small group. And this is, again, all actively participating in your own discipleship. But what you'll notice if you start attending a small group is the lines start to blur. Because when you first start to go to small group, you're receiving. But as you grow and as you mature, then you start being able to, to give as well. And once upon a time, you were the person sitting in small group who was quiet, didn't say a word, didn't know anything. And now, all of a sudden, after years, you're the person who can speak wisdom into somebody else's life. Wow! How about that? That's what it looks like to be a disciple. To make the large group time a priority. To make the small group time a priority. To make personal devotions a priority. I can't read the Bible for you. I can't be your substitute for reading the Bible. But to have that time where it's you and God reading his word. Saying your prayers. That time with God. A disciple makes that a priority. How does a disciple actively engage in the discipleship of others? Well, specifically regarding your lost friends, your lost neighbors, your lost loved ones, the people in your life who don't already know Jesus as their Savior, how do you engage with them? Well, it's, it's kind of simple. It's just conversations and invitations. Hey, that rhymed. It's conversations and invitations. I have a friend, and I see him a, you know, fairly frequently. He's not a saved person, and we just have conversations. And they're very light initially. We talk about the weather. We talk about what are you doing this weekend. He tries to talk about sports, and I kind of tap out because I don't know much about sports. We talk about what we're watching on TV. But then we try, I try, to tiptoe into things beyond that surface level. Well, he talks about, okay, he's got a family member who's sick. Oh, I'll pray. I'll pray for that family member. Or take a step further. Well, can I pray for you now in this moment? Just conversations. Conversations and then invitations. Hey, our church is doing this thing. You want to come on out? Hey, our church, you want to join us for Easter? Hey, just an invitation. Conversations and invitations. But you have to be willing to do that. And if that sounds too simple, I mean, try it. It takes intentionality. Conversations and invitation. A disciple of Jesus Christ has those conversations and extends those invitations to the lost. How does a disciple actively engage in the discipleship of others? Will you meet the needs that you're able to meet? Because that's what Jesus told us to do. And so you meet the needs that you're able to meet within your own congregation, within your own community, the needs that, that just land in your lap. And you say, I can do something about this. A disciple meets the needs that they're able to meet. A disciple of Jesus Christ is serving in their church because this local church needs you. I mean, it's one thing to have someone just consume, consume, consume. And if you're new, just sit and consume if you're new, right? If you're not a Christian yet, just sit there and receive. But for those of you who are mature, saved Christians, a Christian might not serve, but a disciple does. A disciple of Jesus Christ is serving somewhere in the local church, right? If I invite my lost friends and they've got kids and they come into this space and I'm like, hey, come to church with me, then I'm going to need somebody back there in children's church. I'm going to need somebody in nursery. I'm going to need someone running the tech. I'm going to need someone volunteering to do the band stuff. I'm going to need, we're going to need people to do the church stuff. A disciple of Jesus Christ serves in their own local church. A disciple engages in their own discipleship and the discipleship of others. So saved people, we do have something for you. 
If you're ready to kill off that consumer mentality towards church, we have an opportunity for you here. We have an opportunity for you to do something with your life that's worth doing. That's not an overstatement. That's real. We have an opportunity for you to do something with your life that's worth doing. We can provide you with the opportunity to engage in your own discipleship and the discipleship of others. We can provide you with an opportunity to share the gospel with every single one of us, with every single man, woman, and child in the Ridley and Edinburgh area. I am not joking. That's why we're here. And we can provide you with an opportunity to share the gospel with every man, woman, and child in the Ridley and Edinburgh area, to saturate this area with the gospel, and to give all 60,000 of our neighbors an opportunity to receive Jesus as their Savior. And let's bring this back home. Let's make this more personal. What do we have for you, saved people? Here's what we have for you. We have an opportunity for you to share the gospel with your lost loved ones. That's what we have for you here at Hope Community Church. There's the famous quote by President Kennedy. Um, Let's see if you can finish it for me. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country, right? You guys know that? I'm not going to do the impression. I'm tempted to, right? (laughs) Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. You could take that same thing and apply it towards your church. Ask not what your church can do for you. Ask what you can do for your church. Or maybe a better way to think about it is ask not what your church can do for you. Ask what you can do for Jesus. How about that? Ask not. It's not about you. It'll be receiving. Ask not what your church can do for you. Ask what you can do to advance the mission of Jesus here in this community. When we move the focus off of ourselves, when we sacrifice our wants, when we kill off our consumer mentality towards church, we end up receiving something much bigger than what we wanted in the first place. You realize this, friends. We have this brief but remarkable opportunity to share the gospel with our neighbors and with our loved ones. We have a brief but remarkable opportunity to participate in the work of salvation that Jesus Christ is accomplishing right here in this community. We have a brief, it's brief, friends. Life doesn't last that long. We have a brief but remarkable opportunity to make sure all 60,000 of our neighbors have heard the gospel. And friends, I'm telling you, this is our destiny. We will share the gospel with our 60,000 neighbors. But first, we have to die. We have to die to our self-centeredness. We have to kill off that consumer mentality towards church. And once we do that, then we will truly become the church that exists for the sake of the lost.